Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, Managing Partner of Strategic Treasurer. Today's episode is titled The Accounts Receivable Survey inbound cash flow processing. This is taken from the modernizing AR processing survey report that was underwritten with CoreCentric. I'm here with Brian Way from CoreCentric. Welcome to the podcast, Brian. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's good to, it's good to talk about data and AR. And I, I enjoyed our, our prep session the other day and there's, there's a lot to talk about. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. So I, I want to start with, a. will just give a little bit of overview on the survey. So for those who are listening in. This is a survey we do each year. Uh, CoreCentric underwrote it in 2023. So we appreciate that, their commitment to understanding uh, the market and sharing information. Um, Over 200 people took the survey. There was more than 50 questions. I don't know that anyone's branch made them answer more than 50 questions. Um, 19%, just under one in five uh, respondents worked for organizations with less than 100 million in revenue, and 54% were over a billion. So kind of a a nice distribution of uh, sizes of companies and industries, and and it's a global uh, presence, of course, for who took the survey. It covered practices, trends, plans, points of complexity, and, and points of pain. There's a lot of information. If you look at the show notes, you can see a link for downloading the report. great report to to look through, whether you're in AR, whether you're in Treasury, and even if you're in AP, maybe even especially if you're in AP, you can see what the other side of the equation, the the business transaction or business equation has to deal with. So there's a lot of information there. 10 key findings, lots more details, really well worth the read. So Brian, why don't we, why don't we get started? Maybe, Maybe you can start us off on, you know, what are some of the key pain points in the AR survey? Some of the pain points are exactly what you'd expect. Visibility, right? The the availability of data and reports, and especially as it relates to finance professionals, treasurers, and uh, setting setting up plans. One of the most important findings that we, I think we're going to talk about here today is the challenging of forecasting receivables and inbound cash flows and how that can really impact a business. And, you know, if you have a strong forecast, you're much better off than the majority of finance professionals out there. But if you don't, then you know, how can you improve on that? How can you gain some certainty and really clarify the visibility that that I just mentioned. And then there's, you know, the survey is, is, is full of interesting facts. And one of the things I like the most is that this is now the third year of the survey. So we're able to look at 2021, 2022, and 2023 results. And, um, you know, of course, coming out of uh, a tumultuous year like 2020, I think there was a lot of supply chain shocks and markets have taken a little while to get back to normalcy. And it's interesting to see kind of what that normalcy looks like now um, with respect to uh, receivables. When you look at the the results and see the pain points, um, factoring that in with your experience, where are you seeing some variations? What what might be different from, let's say, a smaller firm to a larger firm? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a good point, Craig. So, you know, large firms are going to be, and especially the public ones, they're going to be looking at quarterly reporting and you know, what what's the impact of on my valuation if uh, if this receivable. Um, hits my books or is is on aging. Whereas a small firm, you know, especially those growing, they're trying to you know make that nine month runway until their next funding round. They've got payroll that they need to make next Friday or revolving credit lines that uh, maybe are starting to dry up. And so a treasury team may say, hey, put some pressure on the sales or the receivable side of the organization, or else. We're going to be out shopping banks until we can figure out you know, how to fund our payroll. And so the stresses of receivables uh, on small firms, you know, are significant. But those on large firms, you know, they're, it's, it's much a focus. Cash is king. When a receivable is on your balance sheet, it's not as good as cash on your balance sheet. 
<laughs> That's right. I'll gladly pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today. You know, a uh, receivable is not the same as cash. I, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, excellent. So those are those are some good distinctions between type of firms, and you know that extends to the language that's used, the sense of of urgency, and the cycle. So, you know, there's also one of the things we talked about uh, the other day when we were discussing some of the results. There's stresses on various areas: the business overall, the receivables team, the FP&A team, and Treasury. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to comment on any of those areas. I know we had a lively discussion the other day. Yeah, I think one of the things, Craig, that we actually we we didn't spend a lot of time talking about is how outstanding receivables can impact your sales organization and how it can drive some of the friction between sales and finance that plagues a lot of businesses. You know, so finance looks at sales and they say, well, geez, I'm writing these big commission checks. What have these guys done for me lately? They've they've sold something that I haven't turned to cash yet, right? And when a sales leader is putting pressure on his representatives, his or her representatives to go and collect cash, well, what are they doing? They're not selling. They're not growing the business. And so it's getting back to that alignment of goals, which is grow the business with the right customers, right? Um, and when there's uncertainty around your receivables, it just creates, it, it, it throws a a stick in the spokes of a well-oiled business. And it, and that tension can bubble up into ELT meetings and rifts and fights and coups. But ultimately, if you can get the sales team out of collections and focused on selling, everybody's better off. What, what does the sales team call the finance team? Well, I can't tell you everything that finance calls sales, but uh, <laughs> I think you know. <laughs> The sales prevention department, right? There you go. And and the and the, and the finance team says if, if you're selling and not collecting, you're just giving it away. Yeah, that's right. It's exactly. I mean, those are the uh, uh, you know those those are the challenges, right? Done right, both of those things work in harmony. Done wrong, everyone's optimizing for part of it, and that's the overall business flow, right? Yeah. So. We, we're edgy on this podcast. Well, not really, but um, <laughs> those are, I mean, that's, that's really the looking at everything comprehensively and, and AR is not standalone. It's part of a business and a crucial part. Brian, I'd love to have you just describe a little bit about what you're responsible for at CoreCentric. Maybe just give a, a real brief intro of CoreCentric too, for those that are listening. Sure. CoreCentric optimizes business to business transactions. So, we support clients in both the source to pay and the order to cash side of things. And we bring together technology managed services and trade finance to bring kind of holistic solutioning to our clients. Um, that can take the shape of uh, bringing them together in group purchasing organizations for, uh, for sourcing opportunities, or it can be, um, AR automation and management. We take a consultative approach with our clients and that's really where I step in with my role. Uh, I bring about 10 years of corporate finance background um, and a large capital equipment sales. And in that I was responsible for revenue recognition and uh, chasing some receivables all over the world, leveraging documentary letters of credit and other kind of trade finance mechanisms. But in that I got a real taste for how challenging it is uh, to just run a business, you know, day-to-day -day operations. You cannot set it and forget it. It requires management. And so with CoreCentric, you know, I sit with our clients and our prospects and I, I do my best to understand what their challenges are and what their target business outcomes might be. And then I kind of reach into CoreCentric's large tool bag and try and match up what solutions we can bring to them and really how we can give them those results. Very good. And in the show notes, we'll have a uh, core centrics uh, website for those that want to learn more um, about uh, core centric. Let's shift over to the, the broader discussion about the needs for visibility and better forecasting. Let me say a few things about the results. Um, you know, there's a, there's an element of complexity that we saw from the uh, survey. I think we all know that there's complexity. 72% of firms have two or more collection banks. So there's, they're spread out. And 38% have four or more banks. And so you can see as, as you get more and more banks, the number goes down, but still almost 40% have four or more banks. And there's still a significant percentages that have 
really, really large number. So that's an element of complexity. On the forecasting side, this is a this is one of the pain points. Uh, we moved from in 2021, it was the third highest pain point. In 2023, it moved to the first pain point. It moved up 26% of the total, 13% to 39% identified it as their top item. And then uh, the last item here, uh, Brian, is reporting visibility went from number two in 2021 to number two in 2023. But it moved from 19% of, of organizations or respondents identifying as the top issue to 29%. So that experienced a 10, 10 point increase and forecasting a 26 point increase. So those are, that's the context for the, the needs for visibility and better forecasting. What have you seen here and how should, uh, how should we be thinking about this type of information and the environment uh, companies are in? Well, let's kind of start by putting it into a real world example, Craig. I'm going to sell you a breakfast sandwich since it's still morning time here, but you don't have to pay me today. You can pay me next week. Yep. Uh, well, let's, well, you can have seven day terms. When do I expect to get to receive cash from you? Seven days. But if you don't pay on the seventh day, now what's my expectation? Is it day eight? If you don't pay on day eight, is it day nine? Now we're at day 14. Everyone's asking, when's Craig paying for that sandwich? I don't know. I don't have visibility into when Craig's going to go to the ATM and, and make right. I, Craig could be going through a business challenge. Craig could be on vacation. Craig could have lost the invoice. Maybe I sent the invoice to the wrong folder. You know, you talked about multiple lock boxes. What, do you, what about when you have multiple ship twos and bill to addresses? These are the challenges that FP&A departments face. And everybody is knocking on their door saying, what is our cash flow going to look like next week? We know our disbursements. We have invoices. We're a good company. We're going to pay those on time. Why aren't our customers paying on time? Okay, now how much is our aging? What are you doing, AR team, to collect on that? Are you dunning? Do you have the right contact information? What's the reason for them not paying? What sort of credit decisions are we going to make now that this customer isn't paying us? Craig's been a breakfast sandwich fan for as long as I've known him. Do we cut him off? Right. These are the challenges that every business that offers terms faces. And if you're not offering terms, you really are struggling to compete in a B2B landscape. So I understand why the respondents to the survey said forecasting and uh, visibility are so high on their list because visibility and forecasting inform for future decisions. We're uh, deep in Q4 now, Craig, and everyone's pretty well planned out for 2024. But, you know, it takes a certain amount of certainty and, and especially with your cash positions to go and make those plans for the next year. Do we hire? Do we staff? You know, do you need to cut back and, 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 uh, and tighten up? These are challenges that businesses face and, and forecasting is paramount in solving those challenges. Brian, I like your example. And plus it's a, uh close enough to lunchtime here that I'm, I'm starting to think about that breakfast sandwich. Uh, don't cut me off. I'll, I'll pay you for uh, today's too. You know, there's some other challenges too on that, you know, challenges on paying uh, may exceed billing challenges. And maybe that's worded a bit roughly, but what are, um, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the elements about paying challenges that may be a bigger issue than just on the billing, like getting the billing right. Maybe I was upset that you billed me for the, the wrong sandwich and I was holding up a payment for that, but what are, how should we think about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not uncommon for invoices to be disputed. Um, and, and there's frankly nothing wrong with that. Hey, I ordered three, three units, uh, of sandwich, but you only delivered me two, right? Uh, the sandwiches maybe, uh, start to falter as an example here, but when, <laughs> when you talk about goods where you're taking delivery, and then you get an invoice afterwards and you try and marry that up. Um, it's perfectly fine to say, dear seller, this invoice is wrong. Now, what tends to happen is that those invoices often sit in a pile until they approach their due date. And then the buyer pulls up that invoice and says, you know, this is, the, I need to dispute this. Well, we're now at net 27 of the 30 day terms. And you've got to dispute, reissue an invoice and get it back to, back to that buyer. And, and sometimes, especially um, certain buying systems will 
trigger a reset on those terms. And so, you know, the 30 day terms that you set out may end, may turn into 60. Um, so that's just, that's one example of a challenge that buyers have when it comes to paying. Um, you know, another, a lot of times there's just inefficiencies in how those invoices are received and processed. I mean, uh, in the year 2023, I spoke with a spoke with an AP department just a couple of weeks ago, where they're still every day they stamp an invoice so they know which date it was "quote unquote" ingested into their system. Now their system just happened to be an AP clerk who looked at that invoice that day, um, but you know that's one side of the spectrum. Another is as you know when source to pay software is involved, and um, you know the Arebas, the Coopas, the Jaggers the core centric platforms of the world, right? They say, Hey, I'm going to issue a purchase order out of my system. I expect an invoice to come into that system so I can match the PO to that invoice. Well, if you don't deliver that invoice with the right formatting, right? You know, header fields in a certain order, you know, configured to its liking, it may not be ingested properly. And, uh, and that can be a real challenge for sellers, especially small sellers who are doing manual invoicing. Uh, selling to big companies that use multiple different systems, right? You have to configure your invoices to those buyers. And if they're not configured right, your chances of being paid on time really start to dwindle. You know, use, using the right technology is often seen as helping a, a process become more scalable, more efficient. How, um, how does this, you know, a, a more automated process or a modernize mo- modernizing the overall AR process help, and where where might there still be some gaps? Yeah, so that's a good that's a good question. There are a lot of electronic invoice preparation and presentment tools out there, and what they can do is they can take invoice data and they can generate invoices that are easily ingested. Um, they could also provide a platform to those buyers to go in and and make payment, whether by credit card, ACH check, backs, right? Depending on where you are. They do tend to fall short though, because they lack the ability to drive certainty. And so let's say that you go and you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a state-of-the-art EIPP system. Again, that's electronic invoicing, uh, preparation and presentment. And so you think here, you know, you've made your investment. You're like, great. I'm now, my business is now delivering invoices in a clean way. No excuses from the buyer, right? Well, (laughs) anybody who's ever worked in a finance department, especially at the end of the year, knows that invoices tend to sit on desks, even if they've come into it through a nice, pretty uh, source to pay portal, they'll get printed out and they'll go over to the FP&A manager and say, hey, this one's 2 million. Do you want to pay it now or should we just wait until next quarter? And so no matter how good your technology is, true business pressures and challenges can get in the way and take that certainty right out from underneath you. The physical invoice may be less common than it was, but it still exists. But the physical invoice, if it was there was a problem, people would like you would say would put it to the side to handle later because they're challenged to get things done. But that's still in the, the digital world. If there's a problem, like I'm going to handle that later. I'm going to get the clean stuff process first. And so it it amplifies. When we talked uh, earlier, you had mentioned um, a story that even if you have some of these methods to, I'll uh, call it buying certainty, there's other situations that are just outside of your control. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and the challenge with those is they can impact a $1 invoice or a $14 million invoice as, uh, as happened to a program I was working back in 2019. So a, uh, one of one of the great states uh, of the, of the United States, their police department ordered uh, a large capital good from from our company, and we delivered it, and they were happily enjoying it. This happened to be kind of when that police department came under the scrutiny of certain taxpayers for how much funding they were getting. The pressures at their state capital kind of kept them from paying that bill on time. So 14 million with 30 day terms stretched to 60, stretched to 90, stretched to 120. So this item was delivered and accepted kind of towards the end of the year. And under ASC 606 accounting, when you have reasonable assurance of collectability, then you can book it. But 
We didn't really have that. They, they kind of they, they threw the doubts up early. And so we held off on earning that revenue and it slipped out of Q4, right? 14, 15 million of, uh, of revenue and cash moved across years. And now all of a sudden there's pressure from shareholders of, hey, why did you miss your revenue numbers last year? And it ultimately just comes down to the things that are out of your control. When you issue businesses terms, there's an element of risk you take. It, it's table stakes. You, you kind of have to do it, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that as a seller, you aren't impacted. Yeah. Why, why was Q4 so uh, bad? And boy, you got to off to a good start in Q1. That's <laughs> right. Can't... If only everybody on Wall Street was a goldfish <laughs> <laughs> with a goldfish memory. Yeah. The, was it three or six seconds or something? Awesome. You know, there's, there's, there's so much we, we additional things, so many additional things we get to talk about Brian from this survey or what's going on. I think we probably need to <laughs> have a number of other conversations, but I wanted to, um, you know, as we wrap up today's discussion, you know, what are some of your final thoughts that you would leave based on what you learned from the, the research and what you know from the industry? What are some, some of your most salient uh, points and pieces of advice? Yeah, I think Thanks for asking that, Craig, because I, I think that a challenge that a lot of finance and, and AR departments face is that they'll go out and they'll look for solutions, right? Or automation or modernization, right? But what they really need is to buy certainty and they need to buy results. And if you can find a solution or a partner, if you can find a, if you can find a partner who can deliver those results and can give you certainty, right? Whether that's, you know, whether you're, you're stacking credit insurance and factoring or securitization, um, on top of a automation solution, um, you know, and then tacking on, you know, business process outsourcing, right? Any combination of those things, whatever tends, you know, whatever is right for your business, make sure that you're buying those results, right? If somebody calls on you and says, I've got a solution that's going to change the way you do AR. Say, well, hey, here are my problems and here's my goals. Um, I don't just want to deliver invoices cleaner. I want to be paid by invoices on time, right? So think about those when you're, when you're in the marketplace and shopping solutions and that it's very challenging and that every, everybody has these challenges. When is Craig going to pay me for that breakfast sandwich? It's, it's darn near lunchtime and he still hasn't told me he left his wallet in the car, right? Um, these, are, these are normal challenges and you're not alone. Excellent. Thanks so much. I, I really like that. You know, instead of buying systems or solutions that should lead the, to the results you want, buy the results. That's a, that's a pretty, uh, pretty clever way of getting to the end point. Brian, thanks so much for spending time with me on the Treasury Update podcast. Thanks so much for having me on, Craig. It's been fun. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.